Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, session. Uh, I'm so proud today to welcome people from 26 countries, from four continents. Um, it's, it's early morning for some of you, late in the evening for some of us. Welcome, everyone. I'm joined today by Manfred Träger, VP Sales, and T's Boss Senior Consultant, two colleagues of mine. Uh, but before we get started and before I give them the floor, uh, I would like to give you some practicalities. Um, the session will be something between 50 to 60 minutes, something like that. Uh, you are allowed to ask questions and welcome to ask questions. We cannot hear you, but you can use the tab on the right hand side of your screen to ask your questions. And those questions will be answered uh, during the Q&A session at the end of the session. Um, and also, you will be able to replay uh, the video of the webinar and to download the PowerPoint of the webinar uh, after the session on our website, irisdatacapture.com slash webinars. Um, today's topic is document capture automation best practices for successful implementations. Manfred and Thies, the floor is yours. Hi, hi, I'm Thies. Manfred, no, Thies, Mike. Come on, come on, guy. No, all right. oh, oh, sorry, okay. So, this is me, Manfred, without hairs. Okay, I still have a bit of hair. My name is Thies. Okay, thank okay. you very much for taking your time today. Uh, we have an agenda, so immediately let's dive in. And by doing so, we would like to introduce a video which is uh, touching one of the most important things uh, we, we have in mind when we talk about uh, document capture. Okay, T's. To switch to the video. Okay, video please. That's it. Okay, fine. Thies and Manfred, we don't hear the sound of the video. Can you still hear me? Yeah. We cannot hear the sound, Tis. All right, then let me explain simply. They chose the three of uh, diamonds and they are showing the trick that, hey, all of a sudden all the cards are red instead of just the one card being red. And that was the amazing trick by changing the cards. So I guess there's more to it than that. Let's have a look. I hope you, you followed the movie a little bit without the noise but he, clearly it was not about the cards it was about everything that was happening behind the cards so have a look again what is really going on now that you have a good look of the real picture and you can see simply have a look and you can see what is going on And it's always clear to see how your mind fools yourself. You're so distracted by some cards on the floor that you're simply forgetting to look at maybe other information that really does matter. So you can see really what is going on. Everything is changing and it's actually a very simple card trick, but the trick is not the cards, it's everything else. And in the meantime, Almost everything has changed in the background, table color, background color, shirts of everyone. And of course, also the cars have changed. 
Great trick. Sorry about the sound, guys. Yeah. So we have to apologize. A we did a we did a, a dry run an hour uh, ago, and it works quite nicely. So I do hope you uh, still have got the basic idea of that video. Um, what we can expect that most of all, uh, most of us will fail uh, in detecting the changes in the background. Uh, and and why it's like that? It's because you as a uh, observer have not been told to look at the background. Instead, your attention lies on the activity in the front. Yeah. So a and if you look at Vicky, uh, you can find the explanation for this human behavior. Huh? Human perception is the process and the result of information gathering and processing of external stimuli. So it sounds difficult, but at the end, it's not that difficult, yeah? because simply you filter information and you merge information into a meaningful model. So that what you see is based on a model. And you're not wondering why we're addressing that idea. Yeah, we are addressing that because if you look at document, document capture solutions, we are also working with models. Yeah, document capture emulates human perception based on models, recognition models, uh, with the idea to retrieve the content of the documents. Okay. So there are different models available. So a very simple one, uh, the batch conversion model, where you simply apply full text OCR and perhaps some barcode recognition, or you have a form model where you use some operators to detect optical markers and perhaps the label of the document to identify the form. Perhaps you have a simple indexing model where you say, hey, I would like to uh, detect a contract number as a main index for archiving. And perhaps you would also like to classify the documents because you have several different types of documents. So then you talk about a classification and indexing model. And all these models are working very uh, fine and, and properly. Uh, the same is true for an accounts payable model. Uh, you know, this is one of the very famous applications available in the market today. Uh, the accounts payable model is a very complicated model. It's a very comprehensive model, but as all the software vendors have worked since years on that model, uh, it's already very major and it has a large degree of freedom uh, and you can get it out of the shelf. Yeah, you can consider other business process models like uh, the processing of uh, purchase orders. So if you are, uh, uh, if, if, if you have checked the market a little bit, you would not expect that somebody is offering a legal model or, or perhaps an office, a general office model. Uh, and it's because the bandwidth of all the uh, different things which need to be considered when you talk about a general model are much, much too large. Uh, so you're not able to put them in one single model. So. The message is, as long as you are inside the recognition model, document capture works fine and absolutely reliable. But outside, but outside of the recognition model, you face challenges. And what we have experienced in these years we are working in the market, the vast majority of problems are due to the fact that the recognition model has not been sufficiently analyzed. Great. So maybe let's have a look at a simple model that applies today. And I think the most common model is if we simply would look at an invoice. So I'm opening my Verify um, application from Iris Extract and I have a look at our accounts payable solution. And here you see a standard <coughs> invoice. So there's a lot of logic on the invoice and clearly there's a lot of modeling on this type of invoices. So actually this is a, a what we call a goods invoice. So you're purchasing some items and you get an invoice for the items that you purchased. And you can clearly recognize the structure on this document, the model. And the structure is there is a quantity, there is a single price and there is a total price. And that's more or less the basic model that you would expect. And of course we did capture some additional 
values in that model. So we did capture a discount and maybe an article number, et cetera, but the basic model is understood. And because of that model is there, and it's so clear on these type of documents that we capture this information automatically, and it's intrinsically validated by the system. So that means an operator does not need to look at it because it's checked on line item, it is checked on a total against the total amounts, it is checked by VAT rules, et cetera. A very clear model, great to work with. But of course, there are other documents which do not have such a clear model, even other invoices. So let's have a look at another one. This is an, um, a document coming from the well-known Hertz company who are renting out cars. And if I look at these, this document and I look at the amounts mentioned here, then hmm, yeah, maybe on the first line, I see something like a quantity and maybe an amount and a total. But if I look at the balance due for payment on the bottom right here, uh, it says 12,000 something uh, as an amount, and I have no clue where that amount is coming from. If I see all the uh, amounts that are mentioned on top, I cannot relate to it directly. Um, maybe it's a simple sum of everything, but it's clearly that we need to adapt our business model to this kind of touristic invoices. So our typical goods logic does not work anymore because we took a different document from a different world. Yes, of course, it's still an invoice but it's coming from a completely different type of process. Great, so that's one sample. So maybe let's have a look at another sample. So this is a Dutch election document. Hey, sorry guys, I'm Dutch. So it's something coming from the Netherlands. And the model of such an election document, a ballot, um, is that you have a lot of these uh, nice blocks where you can fill in the candidate that you really like. And the only rule that is there, you can only select one. That's the basic rule. So great logic, a lot of these bullets, but you can only select one, simple business model. Funny thing is we encountered a completely same type of ballot, which looks completely differently. Look at this one. This is coming from the Dominican Republic. And the people in the Dominican Republic recognized that not everyone in their country was able to read a normal ballot with text. They had so many people who were simply not able to understand the document that they simply said, okay, we need to put pictures, pictures on the document. So and with that picture, the people were able to recognize their favorite candidate and they simply cross out this document. And again, the basic model is the same. You can only select one, but it's completely differently. It's not uh, a simple white area which has been crossed out. No, you really have to recognize a part of an image and detect that somebody crossed uh, a little bit out. So that's completely different. Yeah, Keith, thank you very much. I, I like this, uh, I like this uh, example with the ballots uh, uh, a lot because uh, imagine somebody is claiming to have a solution for ballot processing. Yeah, he feels secure because he thinks, he considers, he has a valid model, and this simple example is showing uh, quite uh, easily that uh, with this kind of graphical processing of a certain kind of ballot, uh, the model will fail. Yeah, and imagine you are in a project and you have to deliver in time and in budget, and you are confronted with such a situation obviously you would have a problem. And this is why we would like to address the very most important topic for today uh, when we talk about the implementation of uh, document capture projects, something which is absolutely inevitable. You need to create a recognition model based on a detailed document analysis. And you're not allowed to run off. This is very, very dangerous. And unfortunately, what we can see in the one or other project because this 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 does not happen sufficiently already in the pre-sales phase um, expectations on customer sites are that high uh, especially with regards to the budget of the for the implementation of the project that you have a problem already from the beginning okay uh, i guess we have addressed that uh, let's go to the next point please 
Uh, let's have a quick view on two deterministic business applications. So a, what we mean with that is a classical business application. Yeah? So, and what you expect that the business software behaves deterministic, which does mean you have a kind of specified input, which is processed into a specified output following some specified rules. Uh, so you can say, uh, in, a, in a mathematical form, hey, we are in a webinar, we have to show competencies today. Yeah, the output is a function of the input. Yeah, and all known software, business software products behave deterministic, of course. Yeah, so databases, archives, DMS, ERP systems, whatever. A, and obviously, if the output in these systems is not as expected, then it is related typically either to a bug in the implementation or a gap in the specification. So let's have a look at document capture solutions. So, of course, you also have a business logic part in a capture solution. And this business logic part is also behaving deterministic. But we have additionally a recognition model and the recognition model is where the automation is coming from and as we have learned at the beginning of this webinar this recognition model is imperfect by nature and by the way uh, as human recognition is obviously two so in terms of mathematics that does mean the output if is a function of the recognition model, which is a function of the input. So we have a further indirection in that model. So if the output is not as expected, in this case, it is related either to a bug in the implementation, obviously, or a gap in the specification, as we have already mentioned, or it's due to a limitation in the recognition model. So if you take a look at the typical content of um, projects related to class to the development or implementation of classical business applications versus the implementation of document capture projects. They typically start with an analysis and specification phase uh, and uh, addressing the business logic, IT aspects, integration aspects, interfaces, all the like. If you look at a document capture project, additionally, you take care for the analysis of a recognition model. Then you go into a design phase, yeah? And in the business application project, you look at functional aspects, uh, perhaps the layout of user interfaces. If you compare that with the situation in document capture projects, additionally, you look at productivity aspects. And then you go into the next phase where you develop the application. So we have some kind of application coding where you create the user interfaces, where you create the data models uh, and the business rules uh, behind. Looking at what is happening in the document capture project, you have an additional workload which is coming from the coding of a recognition model. And by practical means, we have experienced that the efforts which need to be spent for the coding of the recognition model typically is much higher than the efforts which have to be spent for the uh, application coding. So then you go into a test and rollout phase and here you apply a functional or, and or technical quality control and if you look at the document capture project you additionally do a performance benchmark. Finally, you put the system into operation and then you check in a final step the business process completeness. So is everything as expected and can the people work quite well with the application? And of course, this is also true in the document capture project. But additionally, you take care for a performance fine tuning. So the message here, don't save at the wrong end. So you need to invest into a project organization which is adjusted to the focal points of the project. If you skip a reliable project in an organization, you will have a problem. So it pays off. 
let's have a look at the methodology. Um, so perhaps you uh, are planning to implement the project based on a waterfall model. So as being introduced in the slide before, analysis, design, development, test, and operation in a subsequent chain. Perhaps you are deciding to use a scrum model or any kind of other agile model which is currently discussed uh, in the IT business. What we, have, what we have observed is that it doesn't matter uh, which um, object mythology you're using. But, and this is very important, you need special roles in the project teams. And these are the model builders which are responsible to create these recognition models. And these are the performance gatekeepers who take care for the uh, security of the, also for the safeguarding of the performance requirements. A truism, finally. A project management is people management and knowledge management. And there is a need for guiding newbies towards recognition technology. So don't underestimate that. You need to align expectations. And um, well, there are a lot of mythology books in the market and uh, quite great developments uh, have been achieved in all these years with regards to project organization. We would like to point out two books, uh, which are already very old, almost 30 years. These are novels. And if you are not acquainted with software business, we would advise you to take a look at these books. It could help you to get a certain feeling, as, uh, to feel the grasp uh, of software projects. So uh, another best practice. So many roads lead to Rome, of course. So the project management methodology doesn't really matter as long as you apply this methodology consequently. However, you need to mind the roads of the gatekeepers and the model builders. Now, looking at a document capture project, a, there is a very important um, idea. And this is saying that the very nature goal of almost every capture project is to reduce operational costs of document processing by improving human productivity. Yeah. So if you go, uh, let's please show the graph, please. Uh, if, you, if, if you take a look at this graph, um, you can see that the larger the automation rate is, the lower you will have costs, uh, the lower the cost for manual efforts for the keying of the documents will be, obviously. On the other hand, the higher you would like to raise the automation rate, the more expenditures you have uh, for the model building. And there will be some kind of optimum you know, represented by the total solution cost in this graph. And it's not necessary to really touch the optimum at, at the mathematical minimum, but you need to be somewhere in that area. And if you, if you follow this recipe, uh, we are convinced you will meet, uh, you, will, you will be able to meet the expectations of the customers, but also uh, you will be able to meet your own expectations, uh, the budget and the timeline in the project. Tease, perhaps you can give some practical hints on, on, on showing the money. Okay. So uh, what I'm trying to do is, is trying to show how to get to that optimum point. And, and for that reason, I am simply showing a little simple classification of a project. So here I'm doing a very simple data capture project where I have some assumptions. So typical, my keying operator is uh, very uh, inexpensive because maybe I'm sending the work to Manila or somewhere else. Um, I still have an expensive project setup worker uh, to employ. And I assume that I have a very small project at this time. I'm using just 10,000 documents and then I'm done with this project. So if I further take an assumption that I'm only using 60 seconds per document to do a completely manual keying, then if I take the complete calculation, you can see that I'm just below 
six thousand euros to get this project done completely manually but you know hey we are it guys we don't want to do things manually we want to dive into automation and make things work more automatic so let's assume i i'm getting to a working point where i only need four seconds per document on an average anymore <clears throat> that really means that maybe some documents are completely done automatically and there are still some documents that maybe need to be completely done uh, with the full 60 seconds but on average four seconds and i also said in this model i am spending 40 hours to do my model building to do my automation and oh boy i am more expensive than the complete manual approach well that's a pity of course and hey let's be honest this is of course typically because we're doing a very small project so it could make sense for a simple project not to bother with this whole model building but just to quickly start working. But maybe let's make a different assumption. So let's play around with Excel. Let's add a little bit to the number. So we're doing maybe a million documents per year. And we're doing this maybe three years in a row to get to, get to an, a different calculation. So if now take my same, complete same project setup, logic and building, you can now directly see, hey, my uh, manual cost is sky high and my automation cost really dropped to a very low rate compared to my no automation logic so hey that's that was a great job but maybe we can even enhance productivity a little bit further so what we're going to do is let's say we're going down to two seconds uh, per document on average work required to get this document done and for that i spend an additional 40 hours to get the work done and if you now look at the math then you can see hey i'm already a big chunk cheaper than my previous automation level and of course you can keep on continue playing with this uh, game so maybe go down to one second play and go down to a half second but the downside typically of that hiring your automation rate is that typically the uh, it's not the case that every time you do 40 more hours the automation rate will decrease by 50 percent typically what would happen is at some point you need triple quadruple or 10 times the amount of time to get even further in your automation rate so and that's the minimum then you're touching the optimum point where you want to be yeah geez thank you very much for introducing that model so as you can see it's not that difficult to create a model which can be used for your individual project considerations. Um, and it's also a good uh, discussion base uh, between all the stakeholders, uh, for all the stakeholders in the project. Uh, and what is also obvious when you look at these models, uh, that the scaling of the project so to say the amount of documents or the amount of information which needs to be processed is very important if you have small applications uh, say uh, the processing of some hundred documents per day of course these kind of productivity discussions are not that important but if you uh, go for a processing of uh, several thousand documents per day of course these scaling and these productivity considerations do make a lot of sense. Uh, and by the way, uh, a document capture solution is still a business application. So terms like compliance, quality, consistency, which are often requested by customers who are argumenting for document capture systems are goals anyway because you are building a business application. And please follow that advice, mind productivity, uh, which is helping you to uh, create uh, a good benefit and value for the customer. Um, yeah, when we talk about uh, productivity, we do not look only at automation. Uh, and the crux of the matter in these projects is that every keystroke and human user interaction counts. So optimize productivity. Please give us some insight. Right. 
So let's dive in into some uh, productivity specifics. So first of all, if you start a project, so the basic requirement for a typical large project is that you're able to track your information. So take that into account from day one. You need to be able to reproduce whatever you are doing. Who is doing what and when and how long? Where is the document right now? Is the document still at an archive station or at some prep station? Where is it? And you need to be complete from end to end. And for all that, use as much useful tools. And in the uh, world of scanning, the tools to use are typically barcodes and RFID chips. So use those tools so you have a direct and simple uh, detection of what is going on with your document and who is touching it. And the next important step in that scenario is you want to get rid of paper in your process as soon as possible, meaning get it scanned as soon as possible and get it stored safely. Not only is handling of documents expensive, but it's also dangerously. Because for instance, if you simply drop your stack of paper along the way to the scanner, at that point, the whole logic of the documents in the order could be lost, which is very risky. And handling paper makes also your process very inflexible because you're always stuck to someone touching paper. If you have it digitally, then you're not stuck to uh, a person, you're not stuck to a location, you can do it anywhere, any place, any time, if you want, if it makes sense. And just a final hint, hey, today, the uh, processing of color information has really gone to the next level. So we're not today working on black and white images anymore if needed. So we can use color information to get to a better result. That's really cool. All right, that's about tracking. Then maybe give some other uh, small definitions that you will find typically in this marketplace uh, on the capture world. So you will hear the words positive result and negative result, simply meaning if you get a positive result, it's correct. Negative result meaning it's incorrect. But then it's often combined by false and true. So you get the word true positive. That means the system says it's correct, positive, and he is actually right, true. So a true positive is the best result you're going to get. And hey, if you get those a lot, great, good job. And then again, the downside is of course the false positive, meaning the system thinks he's correct, but actually is producing an error. And that error is being delivered to the receiving application, which is not maybe directly a reason for concern. The first question you need to ask yourself, okay, what does that do this error to my service level? Am I still within the boundaries, boundaries of my service level or, or not? So when not, then even then it's the question, where is the cost related to fixing this error? Is the cost of improving your capture project maybe bigger than the cost of simply accepting the error and handling that error in production? Of course, that leads to all kinds of interesting SLA discussions, but that's for a next topic. And of course, then there's the negatives. Yeah. So uh, we are addressing this uh, technical stuff because we have observed that the usage of these kind of definitions in projects could be very helpful. So uh, an idea is to take your time in projects to introduce this uh, uh, professional speech uh, because it will help you in the communication about this model creation and about in the discussion about performance KPIs. So as we're talking about productivity, uh, there's always the interesting question, uh, okay, how can I measure productivity? What is the right KPI to indicate the right productivity? And typically people love to say, okay, the best uh, KPIs is the number of fully correct recognized documents. I'm not always that happy with that KPI. And then I will give you some examples why that doesn't maybe always help you. So for instance, if I have a batch that has 100 documents and maybe one document failed to be automatically recognized, then I have a result of 99% correct. Woohoo! Great. Hmm. But there could be a downside to this value. So let's assume that uh, maybe these 99 correct documents just have one page and the one incorrect one has 99 pages. 
and also assume that the work on page level is evenly distributed. So in this case, only 50% of my pages are correct and thus 50% incorrect. So that there's far away from being 99% correct in terms of work I need to do. So it does not really help. Maybe there's also another example looking at from the opposite direction. So if I'm saying I have a poor KPI saying 50% correct because I only recognize half of it, but then maybe the remaining documents uh, only have a, a, a single field that needs approval, but everything else was recognized perfectly, then the remaining work is way less than just the 50% that's remaining. So also there, 50% does not give me a good hint of the amount of work I still need to do. And the customer always ex um, expects 100% results. So this is an internal KPI for my process only. And then if you talk about 100% correct, what does that really mean 100%? Uh, typically these kind of jobs come from an existing process where uh, you're already doing part of this process, maybe completely still manually. And I'm pretty sure doing it manually or any other way will provide errors. So what is the current error rate? And how are the, is the customer handling that current error rate? Is that accept, acceptable, yes or no? And if that error rate is acceptable, why should we do it better in a uh, automation world? Where's the trade-off? Where do I earn money? Do I earn money in my receiving end or should I earn money in my automation end? And talking about uh, these kind of levels, um, if you're talking about a typical manual mailroom sorting, so classifying documents, the typical error rate is something like 97%, which is an accepted practical value. You can also look, for instance, on character level. So even if you do double keying on words or on characters, then you still see the, the best outcome is still something like 99% on character level. So taking a document that may be 100 uh, characters, then every, every doc, document on average has a failure. So let's be careful about that. What I personally like to do is, is a, uh, a good KPI to measure productivity is to see how much work do I need to process the documents that were not 100% uh, uh, scanned correctly. So how much time do I still need to process all the documents that have come in? And in that case, you get something like uh, documents per hour per uh, employee. How many documents can you process, including the amount of work that the automation did? And of course, we need to have a quality that is good enough and uh, it has to be within the service level. But we will come back to that later. Let me finish off with some more numbers so you get some feeling about what can be done in real life. Um, some basic scanning work, which is boring, which needs to be doing always is prepare documents for scanning. So get rid of st stamps or staples, um, any other me metal stuff in there. And you can roughly do that by five, 400 documents per hour. If you're talking about a classification uh, rate, that's typically done by 600 documents per hour. And of course, there's a lot of discussion about that. And then you can maybe have a look at uh, keying, uh, keystrokes per hour. And of course, in real life, that could vary a lot. What is important to keep in mind by these numbers is that we're doing this on an average base. We're not using for top figures uh, that only a person can do for maybe 10 minutes a day. Now we're looking for figures that someone can do for seven hours out of their complete work day of eight hours. That's something that you need to keep in mind. So one comment on that, um, one further comment on that, we, we, we face strange discussions when we talk about a, uh, field recognition rates and document recognition rates and uh, we could already spend an hour only to talk about that because there are some statistical or mathematical constraints in these values and uh, yeah if you like to uh, talk about that with us uh, we would be happy to do this later on uh, yeah uh, let's come to another point we would like to address and this is uh, the self-conception that 
a, you need to have a, a, a good insight into the entire business process. The document capture is not an end, end in itself, of course. Um, yeah, the typical view is that you have some uh, input channels uh, like a scan client, electronic files, email, cloud uh, interfaces or mobile devices. Then you have the processing of the documents within the capture system, which does mean you classify uh, the documents by type and then you do some data extraction and then you feed the data into subsequent um, business applications. And typically you talk about technical interfaces between these three environments. Yeah, so it's a straightforward view, but you should uh, take a closer look. Yeah, so if you look into the processes which are uh, built in the ERPs, you can learn quite a lot about constraints, connectivities, data uh, uh, relationships, which helps you to understand how to create a better recognition model. And the same is true when you take a look at the input side. So it's not only that you talk about technical interfaces, but at the end, there are business partners behind which are communicating with your customer. And if you can create a certain understanding about these business partners and their needs, then you also have a better understanding about the communication between, uh, uh, or about the data which is coming, uh, via, coming in via these input channels. Good. Uh, another point. Uh, okay, you are using automation, and automatically uh, there is an idea that uh, there should data be processed which never has been processed before because you have no automation. So, but you need to resist this temptation. Yeah, please prevent unnecessary data requirements. There is no free lunch with automation. Yeah, so it's almost speaking for itself. So it's really you don't want to capture data that you might want to, but the business does not really have a need for. For instance, a, a reverting to our uh, invoices. So you don't want to grab the description of an article when you know I, actually that description is pro probably something completely different than what the uh, supplier sends on the document. So maybe you have ordered a blue pen and the supplier is delivering a pen blue well maybe that's too simplistic but you can figure out if you're ordering a pc with all kinds of components then the description will be quite hard to match and probably is not even necessary because you already have the article numbers which are way more useful yeah let's come to another point as you have uh, grabbed some knowledge about the entire business process you will be able to use cross linkages uh, between the data, between the information. So make use of supportive data constraints and dependencies whenever it's possible. Uh, Thies, give us an insight here, please. Yeah, tell me what you use these data constraints and dependencies for to make your life, life easy. So first of all, you want to make your automatic process easy. You want to capture as much information automatically as possible with, that, with an intrinsic validation. So you need this data and constraints and dependency to validate the uh, information that you find automatically. And when you have this logic in behind um, and it's validated, no one needs to look at it anymore. But only then, if there's no constraint or dependency in behind, you cannot validate your information. And probably you always need to have, maybe have a person look at it one time or maybe even two times. The same is true if the automation did not work. All these information help the keyer make its life easier. So you don't want to forget that keyer. Don't leave him in the dark because if he needs to do some work, it's expensive work. So give him access to these constraints and data and dependencies so he can do a very quick keying so he can really reach the right productivity that he needs. And also there is uh, another big point, which can be big in real life, because you have to plan for the situation that documents are not perfect when they come in, or that your support of data is not perfect when you use it. So when an operator is faced with a field that he cannot find on the document because it's not there, then not have him wait for that field forever to say, no, you must fill out the value, but it's not there. You must fill the value. That doesn't work. So the operator should be able to handle these kind of situations.
So one comment on that piece. Um, you may face a situation in the project that somebody is saying, hey, uh, I would expect that the automation does work without the usage of master data. So looking, looking at a productivity perspective and looking at the fact that you would like to optimize the recognition model, you could also see the absolutely the other way around. Make use of master data whenever it's possible because it will definitely raise up the productivity. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, next topic we'd like to mention. Um, yeah, you need to create a document model, a recognition model, and you're doing this by the analysis of a documents. Um, and here you need to get the customer into uh, his responsibility because he is able to show you the documents uh, which are important you are not able to do that on your own. So that does mean you have to insist on and you have to support the provisioning of a representative set of documents. If you use a good software solution here, uh, then it will have features to create these kind of representative sets of documents. Please, also here, in short inside, please. Yeah, but I'd like to call these sets of documents benchmark sets because I, you really take these documents to test or benchmark your system to see what the quality is that it's delivering and what the productivity is that it's delivering. So if you have that benchmark set, you can directly go back to your customer and say, okay, if you give me this benchmark, this is the quality and productivity I can deliver and stay within the requirements that you give me. And that really puts the strain on him to give you a sensible set. And a typical volume uh, of such a benchmark set is something that you produce daily or weekly. And by doing so, um, you get the documents that really occur during that week very often, a lot in your benchmark set. And the documents that are only there maybe one time a week uh, is then only one time there in your benchmark set. So it does not really have that importance as all the other documents have, which is a good thing. So it's really important to get a really good distributed benchmark set that really applies to your day-to-day -day business. And make sure that you do it not just once at the start of your project, but you know the life changes, your system will change, document information, classes will change over time. So you need to be able to do this regularly. Yeah, and this does lead uh, directly to another topic. Uh, I mean, of course, if you have a bug in the business uh, rule set, of course, yeah, then of course it does make sense to talk about uh, isolated individual observations. But if it's about the automation aspect, yeah, you should focus on the agreed service level agreements boundaries rather than isolated incidents. Uh, so you should consider statistics when you're talking about automation. Yeah, and to, just to give you a simple example, what I like to see in a, in a service level is typical two things. We're talking about how fast are you delivering your volume and what is the quality of that delivered uh, product. And typically what you're delivering is documents for a business process. So let's assume that at nine o'clock uh, business workers come in and they need to have some documents to be able to start their daily job. So a typical SLA could start with 10% of the documents need to be ready by nine o'clock. So they could, those people can start their business too. And then during the day, end of business day, everything should be done. Well, everything, be careful. Don't promise everything will be done always, because you know there will be a peak day when there will be more documents than you actually can handle. So be sh sure to specify a maximum of documents that you can handle per day. Maybe your customer can give you a insight in what their typical peak days are, so you can uh, be a bit more proactive than that. But typically you want to say, hey, if it's over my assumption in the maximum, let's skip it to the next day. And if you're talking about quality, you have to make sure, keep in mind that you have uh, defined your business model and all your business rules. And typically, if you have a good set of business rules that really defines already the quality that you're delivering, if it matches the business rule, it has a certain intrinsic quality. So actually, there's not always that much of a reason to really do a quality check on that. Of course, that's not true if there's fields that do not have any business rules specified. 
for, for instance, if you're keying a last name out of the blue without any master data, at that point, you may want to double key and even do a quality control percentage on it. But other than that, please rely on business rules. Thank you, please. Yeah, I, uh, this leads to the next uh, best practice. Uh, we call this uh, completeness. And what we have in mind is that you need to have a bindingly, a mutual agreement uh, between the both parties, the vendor on the one hand side and the customer or the user on the other side. And you're doing this with an SOW, so a statement of work. And uh, obviously this SOW should not only refer on business rules and IT and integration aspects or the like, but it should also refer on to representative documents, uh, which are the base for the creation of the document recognition model. And of course, the performance metrics you would like to reach with automation. Great. Yeah, a final, a final uh, best practice. And uh, we call this healthcare checks. Um, what we can observe is that these kind of document capture projects or solutions, uh, they are living, they are not static, they are dynamic. And that does mean you should frequently review the performance metrics uh, or let us say the productivity after the initial go live. Yeah? So the framework, framework conditions for these uh, solutions uh, are a matter of change and also here some final comments please from your side all right yeah if you look at the documents that are coming in uh, you will see that the content of these documents will change over time which probably makes sense because your business will change over time the uh, the documents that are required to support your business as a consequence will change over time uh, the same is true with the recognition result. What you will see is that layouts are changing. The way information is structured on the document is changing. Maybe even your equipment will degrade a little bit because they will be used so long time ago that they are at the end of replacement or actually are being replaced. It could result in a slightly uh, different result that your automation was not expecting. And also people will change. So the guy that was there in the beginning of the uh, project that was really understanding everything and was your brains about understanding what to key and when to key, maybe went to a different project. So yet yeah, you're stuck with a new guy who still needs to learn all the tips and tricks. And all these things have to do with uh, a different resulting productivity. And the only way to get around that is to get into discussion uh, with your customer on a regular basis and to discuss this product productivity. And that as a final uh, answer to this. Are you happy with that, my friend? I'm absolutely happy with that. Yeah, uh, I guess we are, we are coming to an end for today. So the last 50 minutes uh, passed by very quickly. So uh, we would like to apologize again for the technical uh, problems at the beginning, but we still do hope that you get the message about this model building, which is, from our perspective, the really most important factor in these uh, affairs. Uh, thank you very much for following up to now. Uh, of course, you could spend much more time on uh, uh, the content of document capture projects. There are courses available, for instance, uh, provided by the AIM group or the AIM society, uh, which where you can get certificates about that topics. Uh, if you would like to seriously go into these kind of business, uh, or if you would like to refresh your knowledge, perhaps uh, you use these offerings. Uh, we're coming to the Q and A uh, phase. Um, anything. Uh, you would like thank to know. You. Thank you, Manfred. This, this is uh, indeed a great summary, one point summary of the best practices in our industry. So that's, that's great. Um, we are 55 minutes into this uh, webinar. So let's take two quick questions uh, and then we can, we can close. One question from Jane from the US, will RPA replace capture in the future? Okay. Um, so RPA starts 
uh, with the idea to build, to easily build interfaces between different applications. And uh, the very basic idea, I guess, is very clever. But if you follow, but if you follow the argumentation we, we put into this webinar, or uh, if you follow the idea of uh, a the need of a recognition model, I would say, if RPA would like to proceed to develop further on, RPA is becoming a capture system. Yeah. Uh, okay. If you are an RPA provider, you would uh, explain exactly the other way around. Yeah. So not, let us not talk about the naming of such a solution, but there's without any doubt the need of having an appropriate recognition model. Okay, thank you. Second question and last question from Rob, uh, Australia. What is the importance of machine learning in the capture business? <coughs> okay, um, what you have seen, what you have seen here, what we have introduced today is the current state uh, uh, of uh, the capture market, and that does mean there is a need for a recognition model. And the recognition model is being created explicitly with the help of powerful operators. Uh, a certain vendor may call these operators so-called locators. Uh, so we call them search fields you know, or table finder. Nevertheless, there is a need to create these recognition models. So the, the promise, or let me say the competition in the market is about how much efforts you need to spend for the creation of these models yeah and here machine learning approaches are uh, giving the, the the promise or the idea that you can save time to create these models because uh, uh, these models will be created implicitly by observing uh, a human interaction finally so there will be a development in that direction but also here i would say Finally, there is a need for the creation of um, these recognition models. Yeah? But it's clear uh, everybody is hoping that with the help of machine learning, the creation of these models, it's getting more cheap. Okay, thank you. Um, Tis, if you can move to the next slide. So just to... This one and the next, yes, thank you. Just to, to repeat that, you can replay this session uh, from the website. I think in, in, in the one hour time, it will be available. The session plus the slide deck that uh, Thies and Manfred have uh, presented. Uh, you can always go there. If you have more questions, uh, first of all, the question that have not been answered online will be answered offline, of course. Um, you can always go to irisdatacapture.com and click on contact us if you wish to know more about our solutions, if you have additional questions, if you want to speak to our experts, Thies and Manfred included. So please don't hesitate. Um, I'd like to thank you again and um, thank you for your participation. See you soon.